I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening uh, to give this lecture, but more importantly, to bring you up to speed on what's happening around our state, the regionality of resources that we have within the state and adjacent to the state, and hopefully uh, engage you in support moving forward. So it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose. There are a lot of topics I'm going to cover, and I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions, and I promise there are no calculations on the screen. So you're going to have to follow me later for that. Um, and Ro, thank you very much. Um, Ro and I were talking this evening, and we found out that we have the six degrees of separation. So when he was up at Wright-Patterson as head of the propulsion lab, I was program manager for a program at Pratt Whitney and did a lot of interface work and testing with uh, Wright-Patterson. So we do have a, a, that's just one area we found. Okay, let me uh, move into the slides. And um, I'm sure that they will generate a lot of questions. Uh, we are in what we call blue energy, blue being the ocean, blue being the water. The water covers, water covers 70% of this planet that we call Earth. So why not look at how we tap that energy resource and bring it to bear in our whole area of looking at energy as a menu of oper opportunities. Uh, the agenda I'm going to talk about briefly in a number of slides is about marine and what we call marine hydrokinetic energy. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, marine renewable energy centers in the U.S. There are three of them. About our system of systems approach. This is not just one system of technology, but how does it interface and affect or impact other systems. Environmental stewardship, that comes up time and again, and it's a big player on on our timeline and how we're moving forward. Uh, impact avoidance, this is with the marine life. Uh, so we need to make sure that we understand where the marine life exists, how it moves through, th through the ocean, and how we set up infrastructures so that we're not impacting negatively or adversely affecting that marine life. Uh, regulatory and policy siting challenges, this is a biggie and everything that we've done, not only for the ocean energy, but projects that we're trying that are trying to move forward here, even in Ocala, um, ocean environment monitoring and measurement, offshore operations, technology testing and optimization, and one other which I'll address is the whole area of education and outreach. So I know that looks like a plate full, and it is, and I'll try to do this in the 45 minutes. Let me ground you on why we're addressing the ocean currents. If you look at the Florida Straits, and the, this is the part of the uh, Gulf Stream that moves through the Florida Straits, um, it's moving, and it's moving continuously, about 31 million cubic meters per second of flow. It's continuously moving, and it has the potential of being base load power because it is moving continuously, and it can be extra energy can be extracted from it. So that's a challenge, okay? So not only is it moving at 31 meters per second, or uh, moving 31 cubic meters per second, but it's moving at about a speed of two meters per second. It also varies very little because of the constraint or the geography between Florida and the Bahamas. So you can think of it as being a flume where the mo movement of the water is continuous, and it doesn't vary very much. It's about a plus or minus 15 degrees variance throughout the year. Also, the speed is closest to the surface. So the maximum speed is closest to the surface of the ocean or the current. And it's also closest to the Florida side. And if you look at this, this is the Florida side. This is the Bahamas. So it's closest. And this is a, a profile of the current, if you will. Uh, maximum speeds are closest to the surface. Red is, is the greatest speed. Now, if you look at the, this map, this is a map of the Florida current again, but it's a map of depth. And so another facet of what we're looking at is not only the force of the ocean current, but also something called ocean thermal energy conversion. Can we take the difference of the surface temperature and temperature at depth and use that to create a system that will actually power a turbine on the surface. And this is a map, if you will, 
of ocean thermal temperatures, changes in temperature at different depths. Again, this is another version of the same map, and you'll see that you see the same temperature differential, a minimum of 20 degrees Celsius that is needed to convert into ocean thermal energy conversion, as you would out in this depth. Why is that important? Because if you can extract energy through an ocean thermal energy conversion process closer to shore at shallower depths, then the capital infrastructure that you have to invest in is much less, and therefore you're also taking and generating power here, or energy, electricity, and the transmission to shore is going to be shorter. Now, why is that important? About every mile of cabling that you use to transmit energy to shore is at a minimum of a million dollars. And that also means every mile that you have to go through, you've got a seabed floor and the infrastructure, the ecosystems that live on that seabed floor, which you're going to have to contend with. So anyway, that kind of gives you a sense of what we're doing in the area of ocean renewable energy through our center. Now, let me move on to the next. I've got two systems going here, so hopefully I get them going in the right direction. All right, as far as the ocean currents, why is it important globally? There are a number of areas around the globe that have at least what is considered 0 0.5 or a half a kilowatt of um, per meter squared of what they call kinetic energy density. So we've got to look at where around the world this research is going to be translated to. And therefore, also, where around the world there may be companies that are going to develop devices to harness energy from the ocean current and look at them for economic development to the US. So there's a, a, a quid pro quo here. Many of the companies that are looking at energy from ocean currents are also looking outside of the US, because then we start to get a balance or a trade um, um, element set up. However, Florida, with its current, which goes up through North Carolina, the ocean current, and then starts heat heading east over to the, um, over to the um, UK and Europe, um, it has actually the greatest potential right off of the coast of Florida. So therefore, from a regional perspective, not only are we working on it down here, but we're also in conversation with <laughs> North Carolina, which has invested some funds into research, pursuing ocean energy research and technology. Then we begin to get a regionality. So we're not just about Florida, but also about the South Atlantic area. Now, there are a number of questions that come up about what about the current, and are we going to impact the ocean current as it heads over to Europe, and are we going to start freezing Europe? <laughs> Believe me, it comes up all the time. But remember, this is a body that is continuously moving, continuously replenishing itself. Are we going to um, extract enough energy to impact it? Those studies are going on right now, not only by ourselves, but other researchers around the world. Now, to give you an idea of what this means for Florida, studies suggest that it should be possible at a minimum, say we take 5% of the capability of what we see in the ocean current itself or in ocean thermal energy off of Florida, and now we're talking about at least as much power, about three to four megawatts of power, excuse me, yeah, um, of what could be equivalent to Turkey Point Nuclear Power Plant, which is the sixth largest in the nation, and it's centered here in, in Florida. So now you begin to get a sense of how much energy potential there may be, even if we just, just extract a little bit. Why is it also important to Florida? About $26 billion goes out of the state, and those were the dollars back in 2009, every year, for the import of fuel, oil and gas, to the state of Florida. Okay? So that begins to impact us significantly. And if there's any incident, such as Hurricane Katrina started reducing the availability of fuel at that time, 
in Florida, we will be impacted by it. And we were close to being very caref uh, significantly impacted by it. That's just one uh, element of it. Also, there's no real storage in the state of Florida of energy. So we've got to look at sources of energy that are recoverable, renewable, and continuous. Now, what we're doing, ocean energy, is not the be-all to end-all. It is one of the solutions, and I hope you keep that in mind, because it is not just the only solution for Florida. It's one of those, and it depends on the availability, the closeness of the resource. We're one of three national centers, so designated by the Department of Energy. Uh, the other two, one is in, uh, um, uh, in Hawaii, that's focusing on wave and ocean thermal energy conversion. And the other one is a partnership between Oregon State University and the University of Washington. And they're focusing on wave and tidal. We're again focusing on ocean thermal and ocean current. Again, focusing on the research that is available, readily available in our region, but collaborating with the other um, centers very carefully on research so we're not duplicating, but augmenting and uh, enabling research to go forward. We're also focusing on research with other universities around the country and in Europe and Brazil and other places. This is a, a quick slide, hopefully, but it, I hope it gives you a sense of the technical program that we've set up, which is a system of interdependent systems if they're interdependent, because from that point, I'm saying that you can develop technology, but unless you understand the environment that you're going to be uh, working in, you're not going to be able to move forward with that technology, mainly because of the regulatory processes, but also the requirements that we have for stewardship, not only understanding the environment, but understanding how to work in and with the environment, and vice versa. And then also we're working on permitting, uh, we're working on social aspects. Um, a lot of people lo live along the coastline. They live in condos. Um, they are affectionately known as condo commandos. But unless we get out there and educate the public on what we're doing and how they can influence or provide input to what we're doing, then we're gonna be at, at a dead state much like they had to deal with off of Cape Cod uh, with offshore wind. It took 10 years, over 10 years, to get that project moving forward. Uh, we're working in areas of scale testing, technology, research, and development. The energy resource analysis, and I'll show you some slides on that. The environmental assessment, I'll give you some perspectives on where we are with that. Regulatory framework, as I said, is the biggie, and I'll walk you through that, and education and outreach. This cuts across many multidisciplinary teams at the university, as well as teaming with other universities, researchers, and institutes of research. Um, I hope this is not too busy. Let me quickly um, delve on this, and it comes up later. This is a technology readiness level chart. It's a chart, a, a terminology, a process by which educators, researchers, universities, government, funding agencies, and industry can get on the same page as to where technology is today and where it needs to move forward, and how to engage, for example, industry-sponsored research at universities and institutes to fill those gaps, because industry is not going to fund directly, for the most part, in their own companies, basic research. It's too expensive. How do we move forward then and take for the, from the university's perspective and the research institutes and the test centers and provide that taking the research out of the, the baby stage, if you will, and test it to where it's at this point where then industry can put it into a final design and a product. So we are in this process right now Ocean current energy is probably at a TRL, technology readiness level of four or less. Tidal and wave are uh, up in the six, seven, and actually in Europe at about an eight or nine. And then again, where we fit in is to start in this area with, um, with the design and tools, modeling, and then uh, providing the infrastructure, which I'll show you in a minute, which is the testing infrastructure for companies then to bring their devices in and test in this area. 
So we're about not commercializing. We can't commercial commercialize as a university. We cannot go and compete with commercial entities, but we provide that infrastructure for what is commonly referred to, and Roe will probably remember this, the valley of death, <laughs> where you can get funding up to this level from the government, and the companies come over and start at this level, and then how do you get it from here to here? So that's always a debate uh, with companies and with uh, government funders or other funders. Okay, what are we? We're really an early testing capability. So to develop, to help that valley of death I showed you a minute ago, we're about putting in a single anchored mooring system. Keep in mind, this is the anchor, and keep that thought in your mind as we go through the regulatory process. We will be mooring a telemetry buoy that will be out there 24 seven for five years for the length of a lease that we're in the midst of acquiring. We will have a vessel that pulls up and, and tethers to the mooring buoy, and off the aft end of the vessel will hang the device that's testing in the ocean current. This device will be then lowered to about 30 to 50 meters within the column of the ocean current at varying speeds. So this is the mooring and telemetry buoy. It not only is out there on station 24-7, uh, it has been tested, and I'll show you that in a minute, and its and capability was increased to meet the environment that it is needed to be out there through about a Cat 4 hurricane. Okay, let me touch on this a minute, and then I'll go through a bunch of, uh, a lot of information about regulatory process that'll kind of steer you in the direction of what challenges we've had to meet to get to this level. Uh, there are two perspectives that come up all the time, depending on who you are and what hat you're wearing. If you're an environmentalist, okay, what are the environmental concerns specific to the Florida Straits? Um, if you're a developer, well, or maybe conversely, an environmentalist can also ask the question, are there any benefits and what are they for implementing ocean renewable energy? So, you know, you need to look at it with both eyes, both ears open, and that's part of the challenge that we've had to face, is to get people to the table who can think both directions and look at it from that standpoint and make a balanced, informed decision. And then a lot of impacts, you know, as I mentioned before, is it going to change the Florida current? Uh, how's it going to affect the marine life? And then also, what about the other users? Shipping, recreational? Um, also the uh, fishing area. So all of these have to be considered as we develop the program and as we're moving forward, not only ourselves but the other industries, because we're the ones who are doing the first out-of-the-box uh, evaluation and testing in order for companies to come along at a later point in time. Why is this important? For the state of Florida, uh, if you look at uh, the sea turtles or the turtles species, they're all endangered. They're all protected in the state of Florida. We have to understand how they move off of the coastline. We know a lot about the coastline. We know a lot about their nesting patterns and when they come ashore. But we don't know anything in this direction. Do they move directly east and west? Do they go along the coastline? Do they straddle the out? sides of the current as it moves forward and then move back in. Um, these are the things that we are investigating now. And we actually um, have just completed our second year of uh, aerial surveys at about 500 feet of the east-west direction. We're also doing coastal surveys to supplement uh, what NOAA does. And NOAA uh, conducts them about a couple times of the year. So and mostly north of here. So there's very little that's known along the coastline of Florida. We're developing that, that data set, that rich data set, to complement the researchers at the federal level and other universities. Also, you see this blue area. This is what they call a cat coral habitat area of particular concern. This was just found in the last couple years. They're deep water corals, and they were, um, 
there were researchers both at Florida Atlantic University and at Nova Southeastern University, and I believe the University of Miami, who were able to detect the, the presence of these deep water corals that had not been seen before. But we don't know how prevalent they are. However, the federal government has now established this blue area as a coral habitat area of particular concern. Not a restricted area, but we need to see what's down there before we put a device down and anchor down and understand that area. And they're patchy in nature. Okay. Um, I know this is a lengthy list and I'm not going to go through it, but you can, I've already talked about a couple things, but these are the things that we've had to consider in our development of our project and supplying that project to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Department of Interior, for permission to go ahead and put an anchor out there and obtain a lease to put that anchor in. So we have, BOEM is the agency that is the lead agency in evaluating the project. They get in concert with other agencies such as NOAA, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, um, other agencies at the federal and then also at the state level for consultancy. This we started, and I'll show you a timeline in a minute, but we started this activity six years ago. And I've been there five years. So my life has been on the road a lot and on conference calls with many of the agencies. Um, let me go into this. This is a picture of in a minute I'll show you, but this is a picture of essentially railroad wheels that have been put together as an anchor for what is known as acoustic Doppler current profiler. It is a, a, a standard oceanographic instrument that is out there to measure speed of the current. It also measures other properties. But one of the things that keeps coming up is, what if we put something down there and then we have to decommission it or bring it up at the end of the lease. Okay, but what if marine life starts creating habitat out there? So even NOAA right now is debating within the agency, if you've got it out there, law says you've got to pull it up. But what if you're, you've got a habitat and then you're ruining that habitat and the life, the marine life that's established itself there. So there's a lot of debate going on right now at the federal level, and they're not sure how to answer this question yet. They've got law, and they've got logic. So, you know, um, this is a, we've done, we did survey work to look at the bottom, the seabed floor, and this is a sandy area. This is essentially no more than rubble. There's really no growth there. Um, so we want to look at an area that is preferably like this, but you know we'll look at other areas too when we put the anchor down. This was done with a, a multi-beam. Uh, this is also the remotely operated vehicle, and this is where there's more work that needs to be done in the way of robotics and capabilities for systems. And Ro and I were talking about it, and this is an area that is getting some attention but not, not enough attention at this point, because once you get to maintenance of an operational system, how do you address it? How do you determine if you have to pull a device up once it's been operating out there? So you need a lot of the visual optical uh, systems to be able to interface with the operating system to be able to give you that information and make those valued decisions, because that's costly to pull up devices and also take them offline when you're producing energy. Um, okay, what I'm showing you here is essentially a survey that was done with a uh, multi-beam. It also looked at, some of the information was to look at these crags in here, if you will, and there's a, a sandier area. These are actually more sandy. These are a little bit of a, a mountainous area, and then this area, is a drop off. And there's a lot of crags in here, a lot of great area for sea life to create habitat. So from a very uh, direct perspective, when we looked at this area, and I'll show you in the next slide, we developed, we took this information and stayed away from this because it is marine life. First of all, it's gonna be very difficult to put a, an anchor on, a, on an incline 
and, and embed it and keep it there, even though you'd like to operate in that area because the strength of the current is, is greater. But you have to look at making those decisions of what makes sense. Um, just to, again, ground you, um, before I go into this next slide, the federal agencies have jurisdictional responsibility for the oceans. And the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has responsibility for everything up to three miles, three nautical miles from shore. They also work directly in concert with the um, state agencies, the Department of Environmental Protection and others. Outside of that, in the federal waters, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has responsibility. So where we're going to be putting an anchor down, we have to go directly with BOEM, affectionately known as BOEM or BOMER. Um, we have to work with them. However, if we were to take and transmit to shore, which we're not doing yet, then we also have to work with FERC, as well as NOAA, as well as a number of other agencies. And to give you that sense, here's the list of agencies that I'm working with right now. I think it's all, but I'm not sure, because every once in a while, somebody else raises their hand and says, um, we need to weigh in on this decision. Um, so anyway, my hair was darker and shorter about <laughs> five years ago. Um, if you keep your eye on these three squares, they're the same three squares in here, and then this is the same as you saw a couple slides ago. We looked at all the multiple uses in determining where we were going to apply for the lease. We looked at the fact that the Navy has a restricted area. There's submarine traffic in this area, and in this area they do testing for the sub-traffic. So we have to work with a, an organization in the Navy called Sublant. We have to let them know when we're going to be out there, as well as the local Navy office. Here's the blue area, the corals. This is the prime area for the golden crab fishers. So we really don't want to be in that area because they do do some uh, laying out of nets and trawling, and we'd rather not have our device in a net and pulled up in one of their boats. Um, and then we have to look at uh, both the uh, narrow draft and the deeper draft of vessels going north and south through the Gulf Stream. And also to add another little thing, there's the... Um, Port, Port Everglades. So a lot of fishing, a lot of uh, sea vessel traffic goes through there as well as cruise liners. So that gives you a sense of what has taken five years. Now, the good news is we are there. We're close to having the final environmental assessment released by BOEM. It's been a struggle. It started, like I said, over six years ago, or about six years ago. But it's eminent. Can't say exactly what week, what day, but we're in constant contact with them. And there are other agencies that have to weigh in. The state of Florida actually has up to what they call a 60-day consistency determination. They'll take a look at the environmental assessment as it come up, comes out in final form and make their determination if we can go ahead from the state level. And we've been in constant contact with them. They're fully aware of what the program is about. And actually, some of the work that we've been doing and the research answers a lot of their questions that they had when they first uh, responded with their comments almost two years ago. And then after that will be the issuance, when we negotiate that issuance, of the first national lease for marine hydrokinetic testing on the outer continental shelf in the US. So this is going to be a biggie because we're laying the groundwork for companies. We're doing all of that work. We're also in the process of putting together a case study because there's a lot of um, you know, loopholes and uh, steps and et cetera that we've tripped over and had to work through. But we're still working through it. And so that case study is going to be important for companies. And by the way, we have over 40 uh, non-disclosure agreements with companies right now, not only in the U.S., but outside the U.S., who have expressed an interest in wanting to look at ocean energy from the current um, for their, their uh, further investigation. So that's, that's the good news. This will give you kind of a sense from the ocean current itself. This is a calm day, just a, a standard buoy out in the Atlantic. 
Uh, the current that's going by is at three and a half knots or 1.8 meters per second. So a very calm day, you wouldn't think there's any movement out there other than ripple on the surface, but you can see the sense of, of how strong that current is just by a, past a buoy. We're also working on uh, investigation. This is the part about the resource investigation. Uh, we've got coastal radar set, centers set up in Hallover Beach and Hillsboro. And this is a signature of the, of the directionality of the current. However, we've got data. These systems were up and running until, I think it was late Saturday when Hurricane Sandy went by. And it took out uh, the dunes area that the antenna was on in Hillsboro. But we're seeing currents that are coming back on themselves, reversing directionality at different depths information that doesn't exist right now. And so we're going through that process to really take that data and bring it back and provide it uh, to researchers and to companies so they can integrate it with their, their designs and then make decisions as they move forward and putting sighting of arrays out there as to when they would actually shut down. Would they remove their devices if they see something like this going on? But again, it's information that doesn't exist and it's important from our center's perspective to provide that to the public in the public forum. We've also had the ADCPs out there and this is 13 months of data. And red is um, essentially from a standpoint of depth, here's your depth and here's the speed of the current. And if you look at this time frame, this is in July and August and you can see the, the greatest strength of the current, if you will, and speed is in the summertime. Not surprising. This is an acoustic Doppler profiler. The actual uh, instrument is here. This is a buoy. Uh, we have put those buoys out. We just um, de or brought three of them back. We're getting ready to go to four. And uh, we did have one occurrence in our first set of buoys. And so if you're in Portugal and find something with FAU on it, uh, appreciate you sending it back to us. But that's what you learn uh, in, in going through research. Um, I'm going to quickly do this because I wanted a little bit of eye candy and I got the 40 minute sign. This is where a, re um, a signal comes from the surface, impinges on the system. And so one of the questions is, OK, how do we ret retrieve the systems? OK, and this is supposed to work, but it's not. Well, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Um, this is, um, we have been asked time and again to talk about how we're going to recover the, the um, anchor and the mooring buoy. And then conversely, we look at the anchoring system. So we have to simulate the recovery of the anchor and then also how we're going to deploy it. And it's called an anchor last deployment. This is a standard practice so that the actual buoy, or in this case, the ADCP, was released first. And then the last point, uh, you release the anchor in order to better control the placement of the anchor, because it has to fit within a certain geographic predicted area. And then this is the mooring. I'm not going to play these, because we're getting a little short in time, and I'm probably a little loquacious. Uh, that gives you an idea of the, this one I will try to play. This was the mooring buoy um, that we tested, tow tested. And as we were tow testing this, we found out that it porpoised. So what we had to do with this device, or this mooring buoy, was actually bring it back, add more reserve buoyancy to it, so we essentially lengthened that Cadillac. We added distance to it, or length to it, as well as depth so that it could operate safely and for long terms in up to a Cat 4 hurricane. Um, this is, you're, they look like they're bringing, um, almost looks like a bomb or something. That's actually a, um, it's not, that is actually a weight to simulate the action of uh, having it anchored to the seabed floor if we're operating in a, in a continuous current. Okay, let's move on, good. Um, 
I showed this to you before, but again, going back to the fact that we're working with companies on where they are in their device testing, the, um, we, have, we do have hardware. We're just waiting for the release of the environmental assessment so that we can get funding released from the Department of Energy to tow test. Everything is wrapped up in the environmental assessment. And I don't know if this is going to click in. It's supposed to. Um, I'll move on from this. What I have here, and, and you'll see it when you uh, go online, is that there, it gives you the perspective of a, a two meter per second current and a three meter per second current, how fast the rotors will move in that system. Uh, onshore technical or electrical system testing for companies, we've developed this. And this um, system actually takes data from the ocean current and feeds it to an operating generator to see how the generator is going to react in variability of the ocean current before you actually uh, assemble the, the device and put it in the ocean for testing. So we've got to be able to predict how that generator is actually going to work. Um, again, we've got capabilities of, of engineers. I've got a staff of 11. I've invested in over 36 graduate students and principal investigators in research in different areas, as well as uh, the over 40 companies. And the other part of it is reaching out in the education. We've developed a curriculum, a six-part curriculum to reach out to students particularly high school teachers, science teachers, and helping them to integrate it into their classroom. And it's about ocean energy, it's about electricity, it's about renewable energy, and now we're gonna put a seventh topic in there, which is regulatory and environmental concerns, and how you weave that into the classroom. And we've actually taken that same type of curriculum and, and to different levels of kids in the classroom down through kindergarten. So we've reached out to more than 200 science teachers in South Florida. And high tech, new high tech se sector for, for industry for Florida. Uh, we engage companies in the marine uh, environment, marine industry already with our research. So this is not just about funding researchers and investigators at the universities. It's about reaching out to the community and engaging those who are experienced in deployment, for example, uh, of devices. Um, and we have to rely on that industry, and it's helping to re-energize um, some of the industry in South Florida. And that's my summary, and I think it's 45 minutes. <laughs> Did it? Okay. <laughs> Again. And I know it's drinking from the fire hose, and there are things that I will remember after I leave the stage that I should have said and would have said, and I'm sure somebody will remind me. So, anybody have a question? Yes, sir. We need a mic, I think. Could you give us a capsule version of how the technology actually works? Okay. Um, the technology itself, think of it as like a windmill in the water, okay? The current is actually gonna be flowing past the, techno past the propellers, and there is what they call a cut-in speed. It'll start turning at a specific current speed, depending on where, how the device is designed. Um, when we're testing it, we're testing it off the aft end of a, a vessel. We're not gonna be commercializing. When companies come along and are actually developing arrays, these devices will be anchored to the seabed floor for the most part. And we don't, there are probably designs out there we haven't seen yet. But they'll be anchored to the seabed floor, flying essentially in the current, and rather than being um, you know, laid off the, the back aft end of a ship. Does that help answer your question? Well, the energy itself is going to have to be connected in some manner. In our case, the energy that we're producing is going to be used uh, and go up along a cable to the, to the vessel. Um, and then it'll be used for energizing some of the systems on the vessel, and the rest will be dissipated as heat. 
when energy is developed with the arrays, they're going to be working on how they, they bring it together. So are they going to uh, bring ganging of networks of, of cables and then a single cable to shore? Are they going to do individual cables? That's all technology. And you might want to look at what they're doing in the area of offshore uh, wind energy now along the eastern seaboard up around New Jersey and Delaware as to what they're doing. And some of that is publicly available. But again, that's a lot of um, research that has to on be developed and also sighting of these devices, these arrays is going to be important. How close are they to a load center? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Great talk, Sue. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, actually. The EA that you mentioned, is that for the test deployment, for your testing instrumentation, for, or for the actual rotors and the... Um, the project, the, the ultimate goal. It's okay, the environmental assessment, and that's a good question, is the, is the EA for just the deployment or for the operational system, the device? It's, it's all of it. Um, the environmental assessment, BOEM has a responsibility for leasing the land, okay? Think of it that way. As far as the actual uh, placement of the anchor, that's the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. But you, you have to put it together as a project. And so the environmental assessment looks at some of those other areas. Um, you know, what's the, what's the environmental lo environment look like? What about, uh, are you, do you have any issues with lubricants? Uh, what about birds? Since you're gonna have a, a, we're having a mooring buoy out there. So it brings in all the different aspects. It covers the project, not just the device or the anchor. But because the lease is through BOEM, they initiate the environmental assessment. Does that it? it? Yes, that answers my question. It also leads to my next question. What, what is the best way for industry to reach you? You mentioned that. You, you mentioned outreach um, to okay. private industry. What's, is that going through the core? Or? Uh, no. Um, the best way is to uh, just go through our website. Or, and I've got a number of uh, cards here um, that I will leave, business cards go through the website. We, the website has been set up so that it not only addresses public, private input, but also uh, working with industry, showing what our capabilities are in more detail and what we'll need from them. But you can go through the website and that gets directly to us. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Other question, yes ma'am. Has there been any research or modeling on the effects of global warming on ocean currents? Um, there has been. I'm not an expert in that area. But uh, I believe if you uh, go to a previous speaker, a colleague of mine, um, she spoke in Pensacola, I believe, um, that's Dr. Margaret Leinen spoke last April, and you'll be able to get more information on what, hap what research is ongoing there. But it's a good question. Um, but I'm not the expert in that area, so I couldn't do it the justice. So if you go online, look at her talk in April of this year, or the 2012, Margaret Leinen. Uh, okay, let's get one over here, and then I'll keep going back and forth. When you're dealing with wind turbines in the water, you're dealing with a lot of sea life turtles. I'm very familiar with the EPA and, mm -hmm. and protection of turtles and that type of thing. How is it that you shut down a system if there's a defect because of the material that you're using or something like that? So that you, you obviously, d you're dealing with so many different um, entities of the government, how is it that you all work together quickly to reduce the loss of sea life? Uh, it, that's a very good question, and, and I can answer that from the perspective. And it's about how do you shut down the systems if you do detect that there is marine life or that there's an issue with the actual design of the device. Um, it's, it gets into the control system. Okay, how do we talk to 
to the device and vice versa. What information is coming from the device or from the systems, the aft end cameras, et cetera, to tell us that there's an issue, there's been an impact. And so all of that comes through our control system. It's part of what I term as prognostics and health monitoring. And that's the devices, that's the intelligence that comes back, and then we will be able to shut down that device, depending on what we see. Does that answer your question? There, yeah. It's about, it's a feedback loop. Yeah, but I know you're dealing with a lot of individuals in order to get this to happen. You've got a lot of people with their fingers in the pie. How is it that you get everybody to react to this quickly so that well, you reduce that? First of all, we have to show for the agencies, both federal and state agencies, what our plan is in case of an impact catastrophic impact, what are we going to do? And so in that plan, we have to lay out as a team what we're going to do. They have to approve that plan. We're responsible for making that happen. So it's not somebody from EPA is going to be sitting there making those decisions. We have to show in this instance or that instance, what's our plan for you know, shutting down or recovery. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you know yet if it's economically viable? Good question. <laughs> no, it is a good question. We don't know that answer yet because in order to be able to, uh, and there are studies already going on, um, mainly in wave and tide, but also with the ocean current for the economics of those systems to see how it relates to other um, cost of energy. But in, uh, until we get the first device, the first environmental assessment completed and all those costs associated with it and try to help that process, I don't wanna use the word streamlining because that always suggests that you're cutting corners and we're not, but to make that process less cumbersome, more open uh, communication until we understand that. And then what is, what is gonna be required for the life, life of the system is it five years, 10 years, 25 years before you pull the system up and have to be able to um, you know, fix it or, or replace it with another system? That all, all those factors go into the cost of energy, as well as what type of a networking to bring that transmission to shore is gonna be needed, and is there a new technology that reduces that cost? So yes, we are looking at it, but we're not anywhere near making those um, suggestions at this point. Yes, sir. What, what is the actual technology that's going to be used to harness the global, the thermal gradients? What, what are you, is heat exchangers? How are you going to convert it to electricity? Uh, you know, what's, what, what's being proposed? Uh, there are companies, actually, um, the first site that's going to be up and testing is going to be in Hawaii. Uh, there's a pilot plant that is being set up out there, and the Navy is investing heavily into that. Uh, the technology itself is taking the temperature differential and th from the cold water, bringing it to the surface and creating um, essentially a, a heat exchanger system. Um, to, one of the uh, elements that they're looking at is from the water is, is uh, creating ammonia and using that as steam to drive a turbine. Okay, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it, 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 it will be more, from a standpoint of what you'll see on the surface, that type of a system would be more on the line of um, not an oil platform, but a platform out there for the generation of the power. Uh, than what we're doing because our systems for the ocean current will actually be anchored to the seabed floor and flying in the in the Gulf Stream. Yes, sir. What do you see as the uh, tropical storm impact on both your models and on uh, the practicality when you develop a full scale uh, production? Okay, that's that is a good question, and that's part and parcel of why the information that we're getting from the ADCPs that were just retrieved 
is going to be so important uh, to the evaluation of the resource in um, a major storm such as such as Sandy going by. Even though we didn't get hit directly, there was a lot of erosion along the beach. We have to see how that feeds into our our models and simulations. Um, we don't have the answers for that because, frankly, that information really didn't exist until we were lucky enough to have uh, instruments out in the water that we could start evaluating it, retrieving that data. But it is very important. Also, just general turbulence of the Gulf Stream on devices is um, an area that industry is looking for answers to. Because they're right, right now, they're not sure how to model that into, into the devices. Hopefully that answers your question. Just keep an eye on the, uh, uh, on the website and you'll see more information that's coming out of that. And um, I think, is that it? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, my brain just keeps circling around the temperature changes. I know that the currents are affected by cold, hot water exchange and all that stuff and the sinking of stuff. So I was wondering um, about your turbines or whatever device you end up using. I know you talked about multiple or there are other varieties. Have you measured the heat put off by them working, by just the, the turbine working? The, how that would have changed the water temperature? Uh, we're looking at that right now by, I showed you the dynamometer system, so we know from the generator, it's what they call commercial off-the-shelf generator. Um, we know what its heat capacity is, uh, what it gives off in the way of heat. But remember, you've got a system, it's not a static system, you've got flow of water going past it continuously at two meters per second. So it's not going to be as if you were standing here and generating the heat right on this platform. Yeah, but you're going to oh. have more than one in there, right? So. And that'll depend on the placement. They're not going to be ganged together you know, like this. Part of it is looking at the placement or the siting of devices to take advantage of the current, the, the, the greatest strength of the current, but not be impacted by an upstream uh, device. So that's part of the modeling that is going to be ongoing uh, over the next uh, couple years just to get to that point. And we're starting some of that because we are going to be placing more than one uh, device. We'll eventually be placing two to three in, in an area. Okay, we have that's time for question. one more question. Yes, sir. Right here. And this is probably going to be the real kicker for me. <laughs> That's a very busy shipping lane that you're crossing mm -hmm. there. And uh, I want to know what attention you're paying to VLCLs and container ships that are coming out of Panama that will cross that. Uh, the question is about you know what attention we're paying to other users, the fishing lanes. Uh, first of all, because we are going to have a buoy out there, that's the only thing that will be on the surface, um, on, the, on the ocean surface, that has to be um, coordinated with the U.S. Coast Guard. So we have to put out notices to shipping that we're in that area and that we exist and this is what it looks like. Um, we also have a, a FCC license. Um, and as well as the shipping, we know particularly where most of the shipping is in, you know, within a certain swatch, if you will, both for the, uh, the lesser draft ships that go in and out of Port Everglades and then those that have a deeper draft that are going northward. So we are paying attention. That's part and parcel of why we selected those three blocks. When it comes to doing siting of commercial arrays, more than likely they will move outside of the area that we're in, mainly because we probably, if we were to do it again, we'd probably say let's go further north where there's less of an integration or impedance, if you will, of, of multiple users, but why not test the first one and know that that's not an area that's really uh, great for commercialization, although it's close to a load zone. So we have to take into account all of those questions and answers. Thank you. Appreciate let's, let's it all. Let's thank our speaker for an excellent lecture.